relations and corporate communication spanned over 40 years. He is the longest serving African-American in Memphis city government with experience in all three branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive. Mr. Lowry is the first Black History Speaks Magician Living Legend honoree. Please welcome Mr. Lowry. Thank you for being here. Thank you so very much. Tonight, Thank you so very much. It's my honor. Thank you. You're welcome. Tonight is going to be the magician's take on This Is Your Life. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I understand two pork chops began your journey to 807 Walker Avenue. Tell us about it. I lived in Columbus, Ohio. I didn't know anyone in Memphis, Tennessee. Someone from the United Negro College Fund recommended Lemoyne, as it was called then. I didn't want to go to Ohio State, too big. I didn't want to go to Central State. I knew everybody there. So when this guy said, go to Lemoyne, I said, okay. My grandmother made me two pork chop sandwiches and put me on a Greyhound bus. And I got to Memphis. I lived on Walker Avenue with two families. And my rent, this was before Lemoyne had dormitories, was $1 a day. I was with work study. I made $1 an hour. <laughs> so that worked out well. One of the people that owned one of the houses I was in, I was in two right here on Walker, right next to Metropolitan Baptist Church, said, I've got one rule for you. I said, yes, ma'am. No women in here. I said, yes, ma'am. Well, one evening, my professor from Lemoyne came. And the next day, she said, I heard you had a woman in here. I said, no, ma'am. That was my professor. She said, get out. I said, what? She said, get out. So I went to Dr. Price and said, Dr. Price, I'm being put out. He said, what did you do, Brother Lowry? I said, I didn't do anything. I had my professor over. He said, oh, my God. He put me up in a Holiday Inn on 3rd and Walker for one month until I found a place with my classmate, Clarence Christian. We rented a house on Polk Avenue. A seven-room house, it was $70 a month, and I made a dollar an hour in work study. So we used to have- and Don't I'm tell, telling, don't tell. Don't tell them? We've got questions coming oh, okay. up. Okay, I'll, tell, don't I'll, tell, I'll tell you about the house a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'm jumping on her questions. <laughs> Thank you for that. So Dr. Martin Luther King's visit to campus has been chronicled. As a member of the class of 68, you were here in the height of the civil rights movement in Memphis. Please share your experience marching with Dr. King on Beale Street. Before I came to Memphis, I was very concerned that this was a stone's throw away from Mississippi. The Freedom Riders were on buses, integrating places in Greensboro, in Mississippi, and I came from Columbus, Ohio. I didn't want any part of that. But when Dr. King came, I did participate in the march on Beale Street. This was the march that broke up because of violence. People blame it on the invaders, a young group of African-Americans, and they said they were breaking windows. And that march just broke up. And Dr. King left. And he was embarrassed. And he said, I'm going to come back and do another march to prove that we can do this peacefully. You know, he believed in nonviolence. So I participated in that march as well. And that was one of the high points of my life to do that with Dr. King. Thank you for sharing. So as a student, I also know you had formed a trusted relationship with legendary coach Johnson. As the manager for the basketball team, you drove the team to games? Coach Johnson did not 
want to put any eye strain on the players. Lemoyne didn't have a bus, so he rented three station wagons. I was the driver of one of those station wagons. I mean, these are big guys, six, two, six, three, four, five, six. And he wanted them to stretch their legs and didn't want them to strain their eyes. So I drove the team to Tougaloo, to Morehouse, to all the schools that we played at that time. I see. What's your fondest memory of coach? <sighs> my best memory of coach is what he did for me and my son. My son didn't want to come to Lemoyne. He wanted to go to Morehouse. And I said, okay, son, I'm going to pay one third of your education for Morehouse. Your mama's going to pay one third. She lived in Atlanta. And you're going to do one third for work study because I had to do that here. That's the only way I survived. And he said, what? I said, yeah. But he was a great three-point basket shooter, third in the county of Fulton in Atlanta. And I said, Con coach, take a look at my son. He watched him, said, I'm going to give your boy a scholarship. I said, great. So that took a big relief off of me, off of him, so that's my fondest memories of Jerry C. Johnson. That's wonderful. The next segment is called Name That Magician. I'm going to quote a member of the class of 68. See if you can guess who I'm quoting. Okay. Myram was always ambitious. He had great leadership skills and was very enterprising. That was everybody said that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody give me said more, that. Give me a little bit more. Okay. We hitchhiked to Columbus, Ohio to pick up a Thunderbird that a relative gave him. Mr. Lowry, name that magician. Was it Clarence Christian? It was Clarence Christian. <laughs> Please welcome your former roommate and an LOC legend in his own right, Dr. Clarence Christian. I think we have a chair for you, Dr. Christian. Everybody. Pull that chair out so you can have a seat. Clarence, I really don't remember bringing a Thunderbird back. Did I bring a Thunderbird back? Smoking <laughs> all the way back. Absolutely. Welcome, Dr. Christian. We hitchhiked to Columbus, by the way. Okay, I believe that. Yeah. Hitchhiked to Columbus, Ohio. Yes. From Memphis, Tennessee. In those days, everybody could hitchhike. And we did that a lot. We both went to Grinnell College as exchange students. We might have hitchhiked to Grinnell once or twice. I don't know. No, we didn't hitchhike to Grinnell College. We, we drove to Grinnell College and on the way back from Grinnell College at night, to our instructions, you went into the cornfields. <laughs> Okay, I see. I need to keep you two on task. Well, the, the you're funny, taking away my show now. The funny part of that was I was driving and a good friend, Regina Best, was in the car. And I don't know what she was talking about, but it was making me angry. And I went through a turn and it was too fast. And I went off. Ice and snow, as Clarence said. And the car went off the road. And this is what happened. The car went off the road. And I looked around, and Regina Best did like this. Ah! I said, shut up, girl, because we were off the road by that time. But that was an adventure. Dr. Christian, what would you say was Mr. Lowry's greatest impact as an LOC student? Well, earlier I said Myron was ambitious uh, and felt that he could uh, talk his way through anything. So I guess it's, uh, you say his greatest influence, impact. his greatest impact on the, on the campus. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a story too. Well, I, I guess in terms of uh, seriousness, Myron, as I said, was like, I, we were two of the few out of town students on the campus. And Myron came in from the urban environment and I came in from the rural environment. I could hardly speak English and Myron 
I was proper. And so uh, he uh, was SGA president. He was uh, involved, like he, like I said, he won the Grinnell semester. I'm not sure that you, were you a part of the uh, Model United Nations? I'm not sure. But he was a part of a whole bunch of uh, things around the campus. And he was one of the students that uh, the administrators of the campus looked to when they wanted students to shine for the college. Uh, I remember that. Uh, I watched it from afar. <laughs> I didn't wear socks, so I was not one of theirs. Uh, <laughs> now, I know there were no residence halls when you two were enrolled. Tell us about the rent parties you threw to pay rent, utilities, and other monthly expenses. Is it true your residence was called the Seven Rooms of Gloom? Oh, no. Myra and I were very good guys. We were some of the more, more moralistic young men on the campus. It was this maybe called Seven Rooms of Glory and Honor. But, 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 but uh, like my, I think Myron said earlier about uh, I came, I paid my tuition the first semester out of picking cotton in December of the past year and saved my $184. Then I ran out of money, so I had to go back home and get my family to go to church on Sunday and have a collection. Uh, so we didn't have very much money. We did have jobs in work study. Myron was working in North Memphis and now in Lamoin Gardens with young men who were uh, members of families where the older brothers or siblings or their parents were incarcerated. So our job was to work with them to hope to get them out of that pipeline. So we had a dollar or two. But in order to pay our bills, um, we started to have nice little gatherings at our home. And uh, we served up cookies, I think, and Kool-Aid or something. And uh, I'm not sure who, your yeah, hot dogs, I'm not sure who named it uh, Help Pay the Rent Parties. But uh, we had to find some way to do that. And we had a good time. Um, most of the times we had we had very few problems. Uh, the parties were popular. Kids didn't mind paying the fifty cent or seventy five cent or what it was they wanted to pay. Only one occasion I think we had a problem. We uh, so, uh, uh, selected some kids that we thought should not be coming to our parties because we knew what they would do. And we had on one occasion one of the young ladies who was a sister, one of our good friends who had been coming to various parties, opened the back door and let in some guys. And on that particular night, we had a lot of students from Tennessee State at our party. They were home for the holidays. And one young lady, when she got ready to leave, her mink coat was missing. Oh, that's what she said. And we, we were counting our little money. I think it was $84 or something like this. And Myron was worried and whining and going on. So I called my friend who was a friend of the young lady. I said, how, what can I do? She said, well, call her daddy. Maybe y'all can talk with her daddy. Maybe y'all can pay her something. She won't sue you. Because she had threatened to sue us. So I called her father. And the father said, mink coat? I said, yes, sir. That's what she said. He said, it was a sweater. I said, yeah, it was a beige sweater. He said, yes, he was a sweater. And the stuff around the collar was rabbit. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm saying is we were good guys. Our reputation was such that he told on his own daughter. See, we were so we, were, we didn't have gloom and doom. We we were we were good guys. We were Myron. Yes, we were. Thank yeah, we you were for guys. that. I think. After several careers, what would you say is Mr. Lowry's greatest contribution to Memphis? Myron was in broadcast journalism. He was in corporate and and in politics. Oh, Myron says, "Put the mic up." Yes. My classmate. <laughs> uh, like I said, Myron was in journalism, then he was in corporate, and then politics. I think that Myron's biggest impact for me was in his early career when he was in television for two reasons. One is, as you said, it was five years after King's death. It was two years after Memphis actually desegregated or attempted to desegregate. It was a time when the legal system in Memphis was slow to act. And Myron uh, came to Memphis, was the first African-American male we could see on TV. Uh, and it did something for a, a, a city that's predominantly African-American. That's the first thing. Uh, and then, of course, he did some unique things with his uh, broadcast journal. In addition to just being a broadcast journal, he brought news features through the minority report. I think I saw that somewhere. And, uh, and did features. And one of the 
features I thought was great was his thing on Mount Bayou, Mississippi, which was very important. It was a very important statement about an African-American reporter on the television who probably been wanting there about a very important condition in America, healthcare for African-Americans. And so I think that that was important. The other thing is too, is that he was not satisfied with being an accommodationist. He spoke to them uh, in a suit. I don't know if he talks about that or not, but uh, the judge said it was one of the most assiduous racial he, uh, cases he ever seen in his life. It was a suit against the, the radio station. And, and to me, those were important. Not to talk down what he's done across his political career. Uh, because I think politicians over time are going to do what they're going to do. But I'm talking about something that impacted Lamont, Memphis, uh, and African Americans in general. So I think that was important. Thank you. When I was in broadcast journalism, I started the Memphis Association of Broadcast Journalists, MABJ. And because of our efforts, I started that with Carol Hall and John Glaze. Is John here tonight? Okay. John Glaze was supposed to be here. Um, and that organization died out, but now it's resurfaced again. And because of that, there are more African Americans working in this city in broadcast journalism than probably any other city in the nation. Anchors now, and at the time when I wasn't being treated fairly, I had to file a lawsuit. Today, they don't have to do that. They have contracts. They're making the same kind of money that they can negotiate with a clothing allowance. I didn't have a clothing allowance. So, or a signed contract, are you kidding me? That's why I had to take him to court. And for those of you who want to know more, go to the internet and look up Lowry versus WMC TV. You're gonna smile when you read it. Thank you. Thank you for your time and memories, Dr. Christian. Let's hear for Dr. Christian. Congratulations. It's time to name another magician. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I met Myron at freshman orientation. He was from Ohio and had an accent. We just bonded. He was a good student. I always wanted to be around people who wanted to study and make good grades. My first time flying was when I went with him to Ohio to meet his family. Some thought we were boyfriend and girlfriend, but we never were. He was just always a dear friend. You seem stumped, Mr. Lowry. Well, Name that magician. Because I don't remember flying to Columbus with anybody. Hmm. I don't remember that. But it had to be Anita Curry. It Jackson. is Dr. Anita Curry <laughs> and Jackson. Here I come. Please welcome Where Dr. Is... Curry Jackson. Anita, what did we go to Columbus for? Janique, your parents and I, we were not talking about getting married. Okay. 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 <laughs> At that time, you know, um, if you're a college student, you could fly for $25. Okay. Your memory's better than mine. Yes. And so we flew and to Columbus. I met your cousin and your mother. I went to your mother's home. Oh, my and goodness. And we stayed there. Yes. See, I'm getting too old. I don't remember that. Myla, Milan, I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't know. It had to be, I think, after we had gone to Grinnell. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Because I knew your boyfriend then. So you knew my let's talk then. about okay. Grinnell. We, we, yeah. we won't. <laughs> let's, let's move on. <laughs> Lemoyne and College used to have an exchange program with Grinnell College. I understand you and Mr. Lowry were amongst the first cohort of students to participate. Tell us about that opportunity. Yeah, I stand corrected because uh, someone who just left the stage is shaking his head. And I think he told me we were the third cohort to uh, go. And uh, we were all excited about it. And in fact, I have a picture that I'm going to leave with Myron about 
Mm. Us at Grinnell. So for our cohort, it was uh, Barbara Jo <laughs> Wilson, uh, myself, and Habert Bishop, I'm the and good Myron Laurie. Yes. <laughs> he looks on there just like Mikhail. Mikhail looks like him. Now, we were traveling large. We went on Greyhound. <laughs> That's how we had to go. And we had to transfer in Springfield. And we thought we had a little time to go and look around. And we came back and they said, we missed the bus. So we then had to talk, call Dean Winters. And uh, he told us what bus to catch. And he was going to meet us somewhere. I don't know where it was. And uh, when he came, it was snowing. Snowing. <laughs> I was like, already snow? So um, we did, uh, had a great time, I think, in Grinnell. I, I remember at uh, one day they said it was below zero. And I said, okay. Are we closing down? They said, no. <laughs> Classes are going on. So um, I just got put on what I could and went to class. So I think, you know, there... Um, I don't know what all Myron did, because I, we found ourselves, you know, living in dorms, because, you know, uh, here at Lemoyne, uh, all the students were mostly commuters, unless uh, they were athletes or non-traditional students, or they were out of state. So they would find lodging for those uh, individuals. So most of us, we were riding a bus or your family was fortunate enough to have a car and allow you to drive it, then that's the way students will be coming. Uh, so um, I'll get back. Uh, so Dean Winters uh, picked us up, and um, I think he really looked after us. Um, and I made a lot of friends that I still am in contact with. Um, but I think we, we represented uh, the school very well. So how many students were in, in each cohort and what was it like to have other magicians there with you? Four. Four. Um, Grinnell, I think there were about a thousand students and including the four of us, there were about 24 African American at the school. What was the climate like back then? Well, you, um, I don't want to tell too much on myself. Uh, but um, people were really kind, <laughs> at least the ones that I was associated with. Um, I ended up uh, traveling um, to some of their homes after my you know, establishing a, a relationship with them. <clears throat> but uh, Barbara told me that she knew how to do hair so I made the mistake and washed my hair. And uh, people start knocking on the door. Can we come in? Hmm, that looks like wool. Can, can I touch it? So I, the lines of people. Now then she had to uh, straighten it. So everybody came to the kitchen. There was like a kitchen on the floor. And so uh, that's how I met more people. And, um, you know, but everybody to me was very kind there, uh, and even the teachers. So I really didn't uh, feel uncomfortable about anything there. Wonderful. What's your. Know, Myron, I don't know for you. I didn't feel anything uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It was a great environment. Mm -hmm. People were kind and mm -hmm. friendly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Curry Jackson, what's your fondest memory with or of Mr. Lowry during your LOC years? Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you if mine. It's, okay. it's, when, it's when I would come over to her house. Oh. She lived in Lemoyne Gardens across the street. And her mother would feed us. 
I mean, that was a big deal. So I loved you for that. <laughs> well, what made it funny is not Myron, but one of his friends, Isaac. Oh, um, Israel, Israel, Johnson. Israel, Israel. Israel Johnson. God bless him. Yeah. But back then, we didn't have an air conditioner. So it was hot. So he said, I'm going to take off my shirt. My father went into a rage <laughs> and told him there was a door and he had to leave. <laughs> so uh, my, and he didn't miss words, my, my dad. So there were other times when Israel had to go to the bathroom <laughs> and he'd politely say, okay, I've got to go now. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the bathroom. I said, it's upstairs. Yeah. He was too embarrassed to go to the bathroom in there in her house. No. <laughs> Dr. Curry Jackson, thank you for coming and tipping yeah. down memory lane. Was there something else you wanted to add? You look like yeah. you want to say something else. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of uh, statements. You ought to see all these notes sure. she's got down here. So I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I to, this I want to. I um, loved Myron as a friend because he was really focused upon what he wanted it to do. And so he was committed to a four-year plan, like most of us. So he graduated in four years, and uh, he believed in social and economic justice issues and was involved in that while he was here. And he really saw that uh, his degree would open doors for many. So he knew it would open doors to get into graduate school. NYU, teacher corps, opened, right after I graduated. Opened the doors to various employment opportunities. Channel 5, FedEx, City of Memphis. Opened the doors for yourself and others for upward promotions. I was a teacher at LeMoyne in the Upward Bound program the day after I graduated. Uh, opened the doors to financial success. My son's going to reap the benefits of that. <laughs> And open the doors to a great quality of life. Thank you, dear. Yes. Thank so you so much. He's a proud graduate, and he has positioned himself to give back to Lamorne Owen College with his gifts, his talents, and his money. And I want to say this. Uh, Dr. Hollis Price, he was the president at the time, that we were here, and he wrote in our yearbook, there are many yardsticks by which colleges are measured, but none is as significant as the performance of the graduates. So Myron Laurie has lived up to this. He is proud of his degree, and you know, he has held many positions as a teacher, a TV newscaster, press secretary for Congressman Ford, manager of corporate relationship with FedEx and other public official position. So, Myra, I my love you, dear. friend, I love you too. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Curry Jackson. Thank you what, so much for being here. One thing that um, I'm really proud of, when I was the president, we needed new income strings for the alumni. So I started the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Prayer Breakfast. Yes. And some members of the alumni didn't think we could do it, and I said, let's do it, and never look back. In addition, I started the program with Kroger. How many of you have your Kroger cards linked to Lemoyne Owen College? You do? Every time you shop, Lemoyne gets some pennies. And I have a check, well, it's coming in the mail, for 200 and something dollars. They send me a check every quarter, and I turn it into the alumni. So we make more than $800 a year from doing nothing other than having our people shop. We have 83 people signed up with this program right now. And my son's going to take it over when I leave. 
check comes to our post office box and I turn it into Lemoyne. That is wonderful. This year's prayer breakfast attendance was 800. You got it. 800. So look at what it's become. I know. An idea of decades ago. Great committee. Mm -hmm. so many people working. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. I didn't go. My son represented me and I said to myself, I think I'll go next year. He called you out. I was there. Yeah, I know. He, I heard. And I'm glad he did. I heard. <laughs> He's another diehard magician. Let's take a Lowry look back before our next segment. Listen to what citizens are saying about Mayor Myron Lowry. I live in Cordova, and I'm voting for Myron Lowry because he's moving Memphis forward. I live downtown. We already have two good mayors, and I want to keep it that way. That's why I'm voting for Mayor Myron Lowry. I stay in Cordova. I'm voting for Myron Lowry. He's an honest man, filled with integrity, and he's a man that you can trust. Mayor Myron Lowry. He's already doing what others are promising to do. Okay. Listen to what citizens are saying about Mayor Myron Lowry. Okay. You know something? I hadn't seen that in 10 years. Uh, obviously, they got you got it off the internet, but I need to look for that. Myla, your homework. Find that on the internet. Tell oh, me how to get to it. I've got lots of links for you. We'll share them with you. Okay. Okay. Is it true that Hollis F. Price was responsible for you getting your first anchor position at WMC-TV? Tell us the story if it's true. I lived in New York. I was at NYU. I was teaching in the teacher corps, Spanish Harlem, 120th and 1st Avenue. Whenever Price came to New York, we'd have dinner. At that time, he was the urban affairs director for Channel 5. He asked me if I wanted to change careers. I said, to what? He said, broadcast journalism. I said, okay. So I went through a summer program at Columbia University, sponsored by the Ford Foundation, CBS, and NBC. These were summer programs. The first graduate was Geraldo Rivera. So I was trained in broadcast journalism and I had a job here at Channel 5. I came down, met the general manager, and I was hired. So that's how I came back to Memphis as a reporter. I see. You've been fighting the good fight for justice for a number of years. Some of your battles are history making, including being the first African American to win a journalism lawsuit against FedEx after 17 years of service. Why was that fight one you felt compelled to pursue? Let me correct you. When you go to the internet, you will not read that I won my lawsuit because we settled out of court. But I consider that a win. And it was a big win. <laughs> it was bigger than Channel 5. And the great thing about it was they rolled that money into my retirement. So I was able to retire from FedEx with a lump sum payment added to my salary, which I'm still getting today in retirement from FedEx. So I'm proud of that one. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to change pace a little bit here. I understand you interviewed every performer at, who performed at the Mid-South Coliseum, including Michael Jackson, Prince, Isaac Hayes, just to name a few. But it was the lady who caught the midnight train to Georgia that you have a story about. As the students say, spill the tea. Okay, who knows who sang that, Midnight Train to Georgia? Gladys Knight. I was interviewing Gladys Knight with a friend of mine, Sheila Peace. And Gladys Knight was very friendly. She kept patting me on the leg every time I asked her a question. Yeah, honey. Yes, yeah, sweetie. And I was just asking my questions. And when it was over, Sheila said to me, boy, she was hot after you. I said, what are you talking about? Didn't you see her pat you on the leg? I said, oh, that wasn't anything. And Sheila said, she wants you, Myron. 
well, you know me and my ego. When we got finished with the interview, I called her up. She was staying at the Rivermont downtown. I said, would you like to go out for some coffee? She said, no, honey, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and as I'm on the phone with Gladys Knight, Sheila Peace is sitting right beside me just laughing her butt off. I was so embarrassed. My ego got to me. But she put me in my place. Okay. Tell us how you segued into politics. I worked for Harold Ford Sr. as a press secretary in Washington, D.C. I commuted from Washington to Memphis. So when I was his press secretary, he asked me if I really wanted anything. And I said, I want my son to become a page, a congressional page. And he made that happen. And I'm forever grateful that he did that. But it also gave me the opportunity to see how he operated from Memphis and Washington. And when I ran for the council in 1987, I just knew I was going to win. I'd been on television for 12 years. I lost. I ran again four years later. I lost. At this point, none of this politics for me but there was a councilman by the name of Andy Alessandratus. He had been there 20 years. He was a Republican. And he told people, don't send me any money. I don't need any money for re-election. And nobody filed to run against him. So I filed. I clearly did not expect to win. But I wasn't going to give him a free ride. I won by 20,000 votes in 1991. Now, I will say this was the year for African Americans because Minerva Jonathan won that year at large for the city. And this was four years before that. And Willie Harrington was elected mayor. So many folks said, you went on his coattails. I said, no, not on his coattails. I got more white votes than he got. <laughs> so. That's how I got on the council. Thank you. Let's have another Lowry look back. You know who that is? Dalai Lama. Here we also have a tradition. I do fist bumps. Say he got right into it, didn't he? I've always wanted to say, hello, Dolly. <laughs> and he loved it. Mayor A.C. Wharton, County Mayor at Whereas the time. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, is recognized as a spiritual leader of Tibet and serves as an example to all people, living a life symbolizing happiness, positive thinking, peace, unity, universal responsibility, and the development of a warm heart. And whereas His Holiness gives hope to oppressed people everywhere with his dedication to the universal attainment of God-given human rights. Two mayors and this president, we everybody is the same human being. We all have the same experience. We both is a committed violence, but the expression of violence is <laughs> you know, I had a lot of criticism from the public for doing that. And they said Myron was disrespectful to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I said, number one, I cleared it in advance with his people. I just didn't do that. They told me it would be fine. This was not the Dalai Lama's first fist bump. He had had others, but it was the most publicized because it played all around the world, in China and in Tibet. And when the Dalai Lama left Memphis, I went to the Peabody Hotel to send him off. He was in his car, limousine. He looked at me, waved, 
And I walked up and he did like this. And I said, where are the cameras now? He remembered and gave me another fist bump. What a memory. Yes. Your political career is distinguished for several reasons. You're the longest serving African-American in Memphis government with leadership roles in each branch. Did you set out to lead each branch of government? No. No, that wasn't my goal. I actually retired from the council after 24 years. And the city council makes $30,000 a year. And my retirement was $22,000 a year from the city council. So I ran for this position as city court clerk because it increased the time that I would be serving in city government and it will dramatically increase my pension. And that's why I did that, to run for the city court clerk's office. So the third time was the charm when you ran for city council. Why was it important to keep trying? Because you don't give up. If you want something, you go for it. You do the best you can. Once again, when I ran the third time, I did not expect to win. I was mentally prepared to lose, but I wasn't going to give this guy a free ride. So that's why I ran. My final question, what would you identify as your most impactful moment in Memphis government? Well, there have been several. Clarence mentioned, and this is in broadcast journalism, the documentary I did on the Mount Bayou Hospital, Save the Hospital. I received a national award for that. I received an award of 10 outstanding young men in America from the United States JCs, all because of my journalism field. But in city government, as a leader of the council, I was able to spearhead many pieces of legislation dealing with housing, dealing with make, making the African-American community as equal to the white community here. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my New Year's Day prayer breakfast that I started 29 years ago that gave money back to nonprofits here in the city. So these are some of the events that I'm extremely proud of. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this with the Lemoyne family and the public. You're welcome. Well, we have a special presentation at this time. Trustee Mikhail Lowry is going to be making that. Uh, and this is recognizing you as our magician living legend. Trustee Lowry. Now, this is a surprise. <laughs> hey, Deb. Hey, son. Madam President. Trustee Lowry. All right. So we have an award here for you today that recognized the Black History Speaks uh, sessions there to the Living Legend Award. So it says Myron Lowry, class of 1968. So something else you can put up on your wall there. So congratulations. Thank you so very much. I'm going to pass this up down to you and to Myla and Milan. All right. <laughs> so the last part of the program is so that you may be able to make some remarks, and then we'd like everyone to join us for a reception, meet and greet in the Harris Lounge. Once again, I thank you for doing this program and for honoring me. Thank you, son, for this nice award. And um, God bless all of you. Thank you for being here. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.